Nga mai hari mai nga mima o te rupu mi tuhanga, whakaronga, hari mai ki tenei korero. Welcome to our session today hosted by the University of Waikato as we engage with COP26. It's a great opportunity for us to meet together to engage on one of the big issues associated with COP26. Um, economics and financial uh, analyses and issues intersect with uh, all the policy and uh, debates that are going on, um, the interaction uh, between science and its implications, will the implications get worked out in the, the world of um, economic and social interactions. So we have a distinguished uh, panel with us here today, um, and we look forward to contributions. Um, my name is Frank Scrimger. Um, I'm Professor of Economics at the University of Waikato, and I'm delighted to um, welcome uh, Linda Tiaho, Leah Keenan, Liz Oxley, uh, Bongo Kirkwood, and, um, and we look forward to the contributions and we are honored to hear from each and every one of them today. Um, I guess um, one of the things that I would start with is highlighting one of the um, lines which has come out of COP26 already, you know, get in line or get out of the way. Um, and the question is, how do we get into line? Who needs to get into line? How do you do it? Um, I think many of us have seen uh, queuing for various events and seen all kinds of chaos where, um, where the process hasn't been right. So, so we have to grasp uh, the specifics, we have to grasp the nettle. It's a challenge for us in Aotearoa New Zealand. It's a challenge at the level of the household, the firm, the local community, the iwi, the region, the nation. It's a global challenge. And so I look forward to uh, the contributions today. So firstly, Linda, thank you very much for being willing to talk today. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Linda Tiaho, and I'm the chair of Te Aratauta, the executive board for Waikato Tainui, a large tribal organisation in the centre of the North Island. And in our tribal area, our Waikato Tainui is a significant landowner. Commercially, we are a major investor and developer. We have an overall long-term strategy that would see all of our tribal members successful in all areas of their lives, from health, education, to social and financial well-being. As part of that strategy, our organisation is responsible for intergenerational wealth creation. In our group of entities across our large organisation, our commercial company, Tainui Group Holdings, manages a diverse range of developments from farms to forestry to fisheries and property, including a large inland port and infrastructure hub in one of our country's largest cities. We know that each of our developments will impact and be impacted by climate change in different ways. We are working to understand our current impact and how we can work better towards better carbon outcomes that meet the expectations of the people we represent and how we can play our part in leading the country through positive climate action. Our expectations are also guided by our ancestors who were alive prior to the mass confiscation of our lands and waterways, ancestors who had control over environmental outcomes. And those expectations are guided by our future generations who will, in time, ask questions 
about our decisions and our actions of today. We have, as an organisation, imprinted our expectations and targets into our 50-year strategic plan called Whakatupuranga 2050, our organisation's environmental plan and our vision and strategy for the holistic restoration and protection of the health and well-being of our ancestral river, the Waikato River, which is central to our identity. Our commercial company is in the process of shaping environmental, social and governance criteria for operations that align with our laws and our values. It is called manawa a whenua, which comes from a traditional saying, he waiho pua pua kamimiti te rā, ko te waiarona he manawa a whenua e kore e mimiti. Unlike small pools of water that can be dried up by the sun, the waters of Rona are sourced from the earth and will never run dry. Our sustainability framework is based on the concept of never running dry, being able to keep providing forever and ever. I have the privilege of chairing our executive board, Te Aratauda, and we have created an investment framework for our commercial entity, which also fulfills the role of chief investment officer for our wider group. This framework is called Puna Whakatuputangata and it outlines our expectations in respect of how and where we invest. It won't come as a surprise that those expectations align with our world view on and respons responsibility for living well with the earth. I leave you with an ancestral saying of the second Māori king, King Tafiao who reminded us of the importance of ensuring that living treasures such as our lands and waterways are able to be enjoyed by future generations. Tōku awa koe ora, me ona pikonga, he kura tangihia o te mātā muri. Our river of life, its bends, its curves, a living treasure for the faces of the future. Te to katoa. Thank you, Linda. That was really... Uh valuable and it's exciting to hear Tainui's aspirations for for action and so now I'd like to um, move on to Professor Les Oxley and he will bring to us uh, his thoughts particularly in relation to the circular economy and their relevance to the issues that we are facing today. Thank you Professor Oxley. Kia ora, Frank. Kia ora, everyone. Um, I'm Les Oxley. I'm Professor of Economics at the University of Waikato. And I'm also a member of a large ongoing team at the university um, looking at the role of the circular economy in, um, in terms of increasing well-being in New Zealand. That project is Amio Mio Aotearoa. And I'm going to say a little bit about um, the work that we're doing, but mainly concentrate on what the circular economy is and what the circular economy could potentially do for sustainability and in particular climate change. So the circular economy is, is an approach, it's a system that seeks to keep existing resources um, in the system as long as possible, rather than them going to waste. So by resources here, we mean things that we need to make goods that we consume, things like steel, aluminium, uh, computer chips, uh, and importantly, energy. So this requires that what the circular economy requires, what was or is currently waste, becomes the stuff that is used to make new products either new products um, that are different to or the same as the products that created the waste in the first place. And it can either do that by redesigning how we make things so that the waste is reduced or minimized, or it can redesign products so that the waste is explicitly part of the process in as much as the waste is made useful for other products that we might make. So energy is a very important resource when we make 
almost anything, any goods that we subsequently consume. So if we were, for example, to be making something that requires steel or aluminium, we can either take an ore, iron ore or bauxite, and we can create that material. And the extent to which all of that material is not used, it will create waste. And if we don't use that waste, if we throw it away, then when we want to make more aluminium or more steel, we have to use more energy again to create that input, that thing that we need. Now that waste that we've created has inside it the energy that is being used to create it in the first place. So the extent to which we can reuse what was waste means that we are inevitably going to be using less energy because we're not having to go back to the beginning of the chain and start to use all to produce goods. So we can think of that process in many, many different products, but energy and its consequent um, potential carbon emissions that come with it um, are, are part of the process. And circularity attempts to um, fundamentally reduce the, the amount that goes to waste by design of new products, by design of old products. Um, but one of the consequences will be that energy use and scarce resource use will be reduced over time. Now, what can't go to be reused? What can't go into producing other goods and services? Uh, as part of the circular economy, we, uh, we require that those genuine waste products can be composted in some form. So we can think about packaging. If that packaging is produced in, in a circular way, it will be compostable. And the circularity happens when that compost is then goes back to the land. So to get the full benefits of going circular, we really require that there's a, a national level transformation of how we produce goods in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We can get some benefits from some small scale schemes, but the full benefit for New Zealand and for the planet ultimately comes when all areas of the country are part of a circular network so that we can, we can all contribute to making that waste available for others to use and we can all contribute in terms of being able to get access to that waste. So how does this help? Well, we'll be using fewer new materials, using fewer new resources to make things, and we'll be using less energy to make things. So we don't necessarily have to be consuming less for circularity to give us benefits. Although consuming less will give us additional benefits, we don't have to be in a situation of zero growth. How do we get this circular economy, more sustainable, lower energy use system to work? Well, I think it's important to realize that we could have circularity right now. There's nothing fundamentally stopping us having a more circular economy. But there are things that are happening in New Zealand and things that are happening worldwide, but let me concentrate on New Zealand, which are stopping circularity, giving us these benefits right now. One is that creating waste, uh, creating carbon is far too cheap. So there's no incentive for businesses to economize on their use of energy. There's no incentive for them to economize on the use of new materials because it's too cheap. Throw it away is cheaper. Landfill is cheaper. Energy and carbon um, implications is too cheap. Secondly, there are certain markets that are missing in the system. There are markets for recycling which don't exist. The transactions costs for businesses are too high. So again, it's cheaper, for example, let's take new buildings. It's cheaper to chuck stuff into landfill than it is to create a market for unused timber. Many of these wastes that come from building are not from demolition, but they're from products that aren't used in the process because it's easier to throw them away and markets don't exist to, um, to allow 
that recycling to occur. And part of this is that institutions don't exist to, to facilitate the development of missing markets. So getting to circularity has a role for many different actors. So current and new markets have a role to play in terms of circularity. But the fact that we have missing markets means that there are some ways potentially local government or central government can help to create or to facilitate these missing markets. Local and central governments certainly have a massive role to play when it comes to getting the pricing right for both carbon and for waste disposal. There's also a role for consumers. Consumers need to be better informed to make their choices about goods that they want to purchase and why. And a very simple solution might be to simply put on every piece of packaging that we buy the carbon content that's gone into making those products so that people are aware of what amount of carbon they are effectively um, uh, allowing to be created on their behalf um, and along with changing the prices of goods so if carbon were more expensive then it would have an implication for the price of goods but also seeing how much carbon you're effectively your consumption of that good has created would likely change the behavior of um, consumers now, our work so far on Amio Mio et Aroa, this circular economy uh, research at University of Waikato, has shown that these missing markets and pricing effects are inhibiting development of the circular economy. But we've also uh, examined and found evidence that we don't need central planning to create a circular economy. And the evidence so far suggests that New Zealand ministries that are being encouraged to take responsibility for circular economy have different views about what circular economy might mean and don't necessarily want to be the custodians of all things circular. So I think there's a role for governments, we think there's a role for governments, but that role for governments should be more about dealing with missing markets and dealing with prices than assuming that they can actually determine what production processes businesses should, should actually themselves undertake. Now, I'll leave things um, with that for the moment. Thank you, Frank, for giving me the time to raise some issues about the circular economy. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Really great to hear your contribution and, and the challenge of how we uh, get those missing markets filled um, in a timely manner and an efficient manner as, as soon as possible. Of course, one of the other issues which is important for us in, uh, in the light of COP26 is the whole issue of green finance and mobilising finance to achieve the goals that we have. And this, of course, is an issue in Aotearoa New Zealand. It's also a global issue. And uh, so um, it's with great pleasure that I invite uh, Dr. Mercy Kiramu to speak to us and give us some insights from her work on green finance and particularly her insights in relation to Africa. So thank you, Mercy. OK, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, climate finance, uh, mostly informed from uh, the, the research that I did when I was at the University of Waikato. And uh, so my research was uh, mainly about uh, using climate finance instruments for, to finance agriculture in, in Kenya. And uh, it was about looking at the links that exist uh, between the climate finance that's available and the agricultural opportunities that we have uh, in Kenya. And if there is a way we can um, channel the climate finance uh, towards agriculture. 
And so we looked at uh, uh, pricing uh, uh, of weather derivatives. Uh, while I was doing this, there are a few things that are, uh, that, uh, you know, we, I got to know, uh, which are uh, for most businesses, or if we want to mobilize uh, climate finance, we have to look at the risk aspect, especially if we are looking at it from uh, the, pri at the private sector. Because at the end of the day, if we are expecting people to invest in uh, climate smart uh, investments, for them, it's about the risks and the opportunities that they get, like the risk that is involved in the investment and the, the returns that they get from that. So if there's no, if the risks are high and the returns are low, then it doesn't, uh, it's not a good incentive for them to, to invest in those opportunities. And so there are a few projects that have been, um, that uh, we, we reviewed while, while we were doing this work. And one of the projects uh, that uh, was quite interesting was the Climate Lab uh, Initiative in Kenya, whereby the, they had an, a program whereby the financing of uh, some of those climate smart opportunities, agricultural opportunities, was done by uh, in, uh, like giving the loans to people who are engaging in agricultural practices that are enhancing uh, climate resilience. So as part of um, uh, the, the credit uh, evaluation process, the people who were given that money or given the loan had to uh, implement uh, some of those uh, climate smart uh, practices in their agricultural practices for them to get uh, the loan. And uh, the loan was uh, because uh, those, this came about because uh, those practices are costly. It's much cheaper to just use the normal way of uh, farming as opposed to trying to uh, uh, leave up some space between uh, where you the last place where you do your farming and the river. It's much it's much more profitable to farm on the entire land, which you know leads to more soil erosion and things like that. But then, if we are if we uh, provide financing to uh, investments that are looking after the environment, then in that way we can direct the investments into those climate smart um, investments. The other thing uh, uh, was uh, making, creating awareness about the opportunities that are available in terms of financing and uh, linking the finance to even the smallest of the farmers uh, in the economy. And in uh, one of the projects that uh, we looked at was the Kilimo Salama uh, project. Kilimo means farming, Salama means safe in Swahili. So it was, it's about safe farming whereby they used the weather derivatives. And um, so if the rainfall was uh, lower than a certain predetermined level, the farmers would get uh, a refund for based on some calculations that were done. And it was made uh, easier and uh, effective in that it was paid using um, the mobile banking uh, services whereby the, the farmer did not have to, because there has been a history of mistrust between uh, the people and the insurance uh, sector whereby they feel like you, you buy insurance, but when the, when the incident happens, the probability of getting refunded is, is not so good. So, when they used the weather derivatives, the process was made easier for the farmers to get a refund if, or to get compensated if the rainfall was at a lower level. And that works towards creating trust between the institutions and the farmers on the other hand. The other thing uh, that we looked at was uh, the issue of uh, the financial risk as a result of uh, climate change. So here we are looking at uh, if we continue, for example, if we continue doing things as we're doing now, and there is some changes in regulation that requires us to move to using equipments that are, that are climate smart, then it means as a business or as a person who is engaged in that business, you'll be left with some assets that you cannot use. And that's because um, the, 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 norm, the normal way of doing business has been stopped. So for example, if I link it to maybe coal production, if you're producing coal and you, you have equipments that are involved in doing that, 
Then if there is a law that says we cannot produce coal anymore, it means all the equipments that you had, all the assets that you had, you, you have them, but you cannot get any benefit out of those assets. So the question is, how do we deal with that uh, without, because uh, that poses a, a risk to the businesses. Uh, how do we help uh, businesses and even farmers to transition to the climate smart uh, practices without having them suffering a very big loss? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mercy. Yeah. It is really interesting to um, grapple with the challenges of uh, climate finance, both in Africa and, uh, and in other places. And it becomes particularly important, as uh, Minister Shaw has announced, that the New Zealand government wishes to invest more money offshore in facilitating uh, appropriate climate investments. And, and so, your research is uh, important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I now um, move on to invite uh, Blair Keenan to speak to us. Blair comes to us with his wealth of experience with uh, Waikato Regional Council and not only his wider council experience, but his more specific uh, uh, interests and expertise in relation to climate change and policy responses. So it's with great pleasure I welcome you, Blair, to present to us now. Uh, kia ora, Frank. Um, <clears throat> uh, ana, uh, ki my fellow panellists and, uh, and to the event organisers and tēnā tātou katoa uh, to those who are watching. Um, I'm the Principal Economist at the Waikato Regional Council. Um, I grew up in Otago, but for the last 12 years, I've lived in the Waikato region, uh, nourished by the Awa and in the shelter of uh, the Maunga of the region. Um, today, I want to take a little bit of a step back um, and, and talk about um, how we make decisions um, in this space and how policy and economics interact, because climate change is the challenge for our generation. Um, I think, uh, both in terms of policy and economics, and we all need to be pulling in the same direction. Um, now, there's an old adage in the, um, in the policy world that you can only manage what you can measure. Now, I don't know if that's strictly true, but um, in the climate change context, um, we need to think about, well, what does that mean? Um, what are we trying to measure and, um, and how do you do that? And once you work those things out, what do you do about it? Now, if you'll bear with me for a minute, um, I want to talk about gross domestic product um, or GDP, which is, is a way that we've often used for measuring um, the economy. Um, now, GDP is well and good for, for what it was designed to do. Um, it, was, it was a measure that was designed in the 1930s um, when the, the primary policy problem of the day was mass unemployment. And it's actually very good at measuring the kinds of activities that create jobs. So if that's your goal, then GDP is actually a really good measure. But most people who have been paying attention um, know that GDP misses a whole lot of other things, um, and it's not well suited for dealing with uh, some of the problems that we're facing today, like, um, how we deal with the costs of, of carbon emissions, uh, damage to nature, loss of ecosystems. So in the 1990s, this led uh, an economist called Robert Costanza uh, and a bunch of his colleagues um, to try and put a value on the Earth's ecosystem services. Um, they, they came up with a figure of uh, something like $33 trillion. Um, which was quite a lot higher than uh, GDP, uh, global GDP at the time. Um, now, as, as many people have noted, um, this is a, a mighty low ball estimate for what's effectively something of infinite value. Um, and others have pointed out that um, trying to put a dollar figure on this is, is just um, morally wrong. And, and those are 
Um, those are valid points. But I think the point that Costanza and co were trying to make is that, um, that essentially nature underpins everything we do. And unless we understand um, what we're doing, um, then, and, and how those things can damage or destroy so much of the value that our economy is based on, is built on, um, then, then we put all that at risk. So we need to build into our decision making um, about what we produce and how we produce it and how we regulate that production. Uh, otherwise, we're jeopardizing not just our financial wealth, or our incomes, uh, but our lives and the lives of those to come. Now, even though that was more than 20 years ago now that that work was done, we're still effectively making decisions by accident in a lot of cases. Uh, we're failing to incorporate all those costs of our actions on the environment. And one particular problem is the way that we've misunderstood risk and uncertainty um, and the, the, the asymmetric nature of the risk. So we might assess a particular decision or a policy or a business project um, and look at the benefits of it, but we don't think very clearly about its contribution to potentially infinite downsides. So we need to get a far better way of understanding how systems work. Uh, not just linear processes, um, otherwise we end up with unintended consequences on a global scale, which is what we're facing at the moment. And I think we do have the tools, um, the circular economy that uh, Professor Oxley described earlier, um, and some really practical stuff, um, as Mercy was talking about. Um, the Treasury's Living Standards Framework, which just came out, uh, an updated version of it came out a week ago, um, with its recognition of, of nature and culture and how, how those should be incorporated into our decisions. Um, and I think another one is um, the belated realisation of what Mātauranga Māori um, has to teach us and bring to um, our decision making. Even the, the Local Government Act, um, which is what I work under a lot, um, and, and the much maligned Resource Management Act, uh, with their emphasis on, on the four well-beings, on future generation, uh, and on indigenous voices, um, they've got the, the, the bones there for making good decisions. Um, but we need to interpret those things and implement them um, through our, a lens of our values, rather than our short-term interests. And then I think together we can, we can pill good policy. Um, but we do need to recognize that it's not cost, costless, it won't be costless. Um, and in order for us to all uh, be better off in the end, there will be those that lose out in terms of their short-term interests. So we need to understand that that is what's driving um, a lot of the, the policy inaction that we see. And that's, that's again where a contribution that I think economics can make. Um, we know what we need to achieve, but economics can help us to understand um, what those costs are gonna look like, who they fall on, uh, how we can help that process move and, and remove that um, roadblock to policy inaction. Um, how we can minimize those costs and still save the world at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. What a great place to end on in terms of uh, reducing the roadblocks, uh, minimizing the costs in saving the world, bringing the three together. That's uh, really powerful. Now we move on um, to, for me to introduce Rongo Kirkwood. And before she starts, I, I just acknowledge that uh, we've um, talked about um, mobilizing finance 
and you've talked about things in Africa and things far away, but there are also issues much closer to home. And, and the other observation that I would make is that um, sometimes it's, it's very easy to um, think about the decisions that are made in far away places like uh, Glasgow or, or Wellington, but there are also decisions that we can make and do make and get made much closer to home. And so it's with real pleasure, Rongo, we welcome you to the panel today. Frank, thank you uh, for the invitation at Waikato University for um, inviting us to contribute to this conversation. Um, we're really, really um, privileged to be part of this. Uh, so, um, and I want to mihi to Linda, to Liz, and to Mercy, and for Blair, and for sharing um, the conversations that you've just finished sharing with us. So, ko wai aho, ko taupiri te maunga, Ko waikato te awa, ko tainui te waka, ko waikato mani o poto te iwi, ko Ngāti Mahuta te hapu, ko Turanga Waiwai te marae, no ngā rua wahia ahau. Ko rungo kū ko taku ingwa. My sacred mountain is Tauperi. My, my sacred river is Waikato. My ancestral canoe is Tainui. My tribe is Waikato mani o poto. And my home is Ngā rua wahia. And my name is Rungo Kirkwood. I've just shared with you who I papa, or genetically connect to, my environment and my people. And I wish I could spend more time in sharing more. However, I belong to a philanthropic organisation called Te Puna o Waikato. Trust Waikato is a community trust that serves the people of the Waikato region in Aotearoa. And I'm hoping that um, you would have seen an image of my home uh, through the presentation uh, of Linda. Trust Waikato has a commitment to improve environmental outcomes. The trust is a signatory to the principles for responsible investment that focuses investment risk assessment through an ESG lens, or a environmental, social and governance lens. To reduce our carbon footprint, the Trust has also developed a climate change commitment in climate change framework. Our sustainability commitment acknowledges that human-induced climate change poses a serious and immediate risk to our communities and that urgent action is required to avoid catastrophic effects for our people and environment. We believe, Trust Waikato, that we have a role to play in mitigating the most severe impacts of climate change and that we need to work together to develop a resilient community response in order to ensure true kaitiakitanga, or guardianship, of our resources for future generations. The effects of climate change will not be felt equally amongst our community, and we need to mitigate the inequality of these impacts. Trust Waikato is committed to becoming a climate leader, to enable a low emissions future. This will be done by actioning our climate change framework. Grant making. We aim to understand the impact that grants make to reduce climate change and to provide support to the community to understand and reduce their own climate emissions. Our operations. We will develop transparent and measurable actions in reporting to reduce climate change emissions that result from the operational activity of Trust Waikato. Investment portfolios. By evaluating the impacts of Trust Waikato's investments, we will reduce the climate change emissions of the Trust investment portfolios. 
So, what's some examples of the commitments that we've done already? So, with our grant making, we see our role as connectors. We can connect transformational leaders from our communities to come together and facilitate conversations on how each of us have a role to play in significantly reducing our carbon emissions and implementing collective action. We acknowledge that tangata whenua or iwi Māori have a significant role to play in the space and need to be involved in conversations and initiatives from the start. So our call for action is philanthropic organisations, you know, consider and, and you need to ensure that any call for action needs to involve Indigenous peoples from the beginning. Operations. Internally, we have implemented a comprehensive internal review of our operational activities and identified key areas that, we will, that will assist us to reduce our carbon emissions. Externally, we have implemented a pilot project with some of the communities uh, we fund to undertake their own internal reviews of their operational activities. And we are working on extending this project to include our wider philanthropic sector, starting with our own whānau of Aotearoa Community Trusts. A call for action for philanthropic organisations is that we need to lead by example and then lead out. So um, in closing, investment portfolios, we are aligning with the Paris Accord and looking at, our, and looking at um, aligning our frameworks with the Paris Accord initiatives. And in closing, this is only a snippet on how philanthropy and Aotearoa can contribute towards a sustainable, thriving Aotearoa. Kia ora tato. Kia ora, Ronga. That, that's really uh, exciting as we consider the, uh, the opportunities and responsibilities of philanthropic organisations and community organisations. Uh, sometimes it's easy to hold a, a yardstick up to Greenpeace and say, does Greenpeace uh, um, live what it talks, but that same yardstick um, needs to be held to us all. And it, it's not just a sort of a, a, a harsh yardstick, but it's an empowering um, challenge to us, how we can do better. And uh, clearly, Wakato Community Trust is, is leading the way. Thank you. So now we have um, the opportunity to um, respond to any of the messages that um, other panellists have um, contributed today. And so I will um, start with Les and then go to Mercy, then to Blair and back to Ongo for the final word. Um, and so Liz, do you have any um, observations that you would like to um, share with us in terms of your reactions to uh, the contributions of other panellists? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank. I think the, the discussion on um, what I might describe as, as green finance is, is really an important, <clears throat> excuse me, an important issue in moving forward. Uh, that green finance could be either private sector based, as we as we heard, um, or it could be philanthropic, or it could be public sector encouraged as well. I think there are all of these outlets are going to be important, and and already consumers and those who are contributing to saving schemes are putting their money where their mouth is and wanting to know much more about the, the uh, investment portfolios uh, where their money is being invested. And I think that this is a, you know, a very powerful tool going, going forward. And I, I, I acknowledge that um, um, our, our local philanthropic organizations have a huge role, often a role that is um, 
not as uh, high profile as, as it maybe should be in this respect, uh, but, but leading from the front. In terms of uh, comments on, on what Blair has said, I, I certainly agree that we, we have the tools. I, I think that one issue that, that really um, um, is at the forefront is, is really about timescales and that central government, um, if we want to put it in the technical sense, has a different discount rate to local government and a dis different discount rate when it comes to the planet. And that re relying on central government to take these initiatives, I think is one which is, um, if not doomed to failure, is one that is not optimal. And clearly when I talked about carbon being too, too cheap, uh, I think politically it's too cheap. Um, it, sorry, politically it would be too expensive for them to enact the sorts of policies that would be required to give the correct signal about the required price of carbon. Um, so I think that relying on central governments to, to solve our problems, our climate problems, is um, not only risky, but I think it's starting from the, the wrong end. So I enjoyed all presentations. Thank you, all of you, for making very strong and uh, persuasive arguments. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Liz. We'll jump straight to Missy. Okay, so I'd like to, uh, to say that I enjoyed the presentations from, from the rest of the team. Uh, one of the things that uh, stood out to me was uh, that we need to, to try to shift the focus from short-term profits to the long-term uh, profits and benefits, which most of uh, the organizations, especially from an accounting perspective, we are not able to include that uh, as part of our financial reporting. So we need to have a way to have that incorporated so that instead of just focusing on the short-term profits, we can look at uh, the whole sum uh, picture. And that could involve uh, Community engagement, like uh, we had uh, how the communities are getting engaged in, uh, in, in the climate change uh, uh, landscape, uh, because um, the community's perspective is more of how to leave a, a good inheritance for the people who come after. So there is need to partner between the businesses, the community, and the and, and the government in order to come up with a solution because uh, this challenge cannot be managed from just one single perspective alone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Missy. Blair, would you like to respond? Um, sure. <clears throat> and first of all, um, I, I also very much enjoyed all three presentations and found them all quite encouraging. Um, that you know, in in the different respects, um, you can see progress happening. Um, <clears throat> I said at the beginning of my my earlier um, talk that um, uh, you know the old adage that you can only manage what you can measure, um, but I think that um, you know with the points that that Liz has just made. Um, we can't, we're not in a position where we can wait so that, the, that we can measure everything um, to the degree that we might like to. Um, we really need um, people to stand up and show leadership um, uh, because we know that, that we need to act. And I agree that um, the government certainly isn't the be all and end all. We can't rely on it to, to fix these problems. Um, and it, it does and need to involve the community and business and um, indigenous voices, um, all of these things. Um, it, it put me in mind um, of, of the, the response in America um, uh, to World War II when uh, they found themselves 
completely unprepared um, for the challenges that they faced um, when they suddenly found themselves thrust into a war. Um, and what, what President Roosevelt did at the time was um, he mobilized the whole country uh, through his leadership. Uh, he got in um, the head of Sears Roebuck, which is a big retailing uh, outfit to organize logistics. Um, he got uh, the head of GM uh, and Chrysler and, um, and US Steel um, and mobilized all of those different resources um, who were good at doing stuff that needed to be done at the time. And, and I think that's a really good example of um, how uh, if we have the will and work together, um, we can switch things around quite quickly when we need to. Thanks. Thank you, Blair. To turn things around, that, that is uh, the challenge so that we don't continue on the pathway of an ever increasing warming earth. It is great to have these uh, contributions today, and I'm going to give uh, Rongo the opportunity to have the last word in our uh, panel today. But before I um, give her that opportunity to provide the, the final word, I observe, you know, it is an ongoing challenge, isn't it, to make good decisions at multiple levels on the basis of limited information. But limited information, um, you know, information's always been limited in every area of life. And we don't wait till we've um, got a PhD before we, uh, you know, learn to drive a car. We, we, we make choices along the way. And I think part of uh, the challenge for us and for our governments and our other organizations is to use the organizations that we have and to use the relationships that we have and to uh, energetically and, uh, and with engagement work together to address the bigger challenge. So we'll bring this session to a close with Rongo. So thank you panelists and welcome Rongo. Um, one of the most valuable things that I've got from our um, session is our um, engagement with each other, I have to say. Um, and in closing, what does that look like? So I'm going to refer to uh, a um, whakatauki. Mā whero, mā pangu ka oti ai te mahi. So what does that mean? That means your contribution, everyone's contribution will um, and all the efforts that we have will um, ensure that the work will be done and will be continued and will continue to get done in, in the manner that it should be. So um, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, yeah, contribute to the space. The University of Waikato is proud to introduce the world's first Bachelor of Climate Change for the people who know there is no planet B gain the skills needed for the jobs of tomorrow, contribute to a fundamental shift in the way we do business and go about our lives, explore how mātauranga Māori can bring perspective to the most pressing issue of our time, apply now and carve a career where passion and purpose collide.